Welcome to worship on this Sunday. On behalf of Swarthmore Presbyterian Church, I extend a special welcome to all friends and newcomers who are worshiping with us. If you are new to this worshiping community, I invite you to contact the church. We would like to know of your presence among us. This morning at 1115, we are hosting a newcomers gathering via Zoom. You are welcome at this time to set aside, to ask questions, get to know one another, and share a little of yourself with my colleagues and others in an informal setting. For information on how to join, please contact Parish Administrator Dory McGrath. We are on the road of Lent, friends, and our invitation is to transformation. Our worship and preaching in these weeks is shaped by the question, when has my mind been changed? We lean into the possibility that our thinking and experience of God's good world evolves, dwelling in the spirits of vulnerability, trusting that Christ is both the author of our grace and the momentum behind all loving and true transformation. We invite you this month to consider a contribution to One Great Hour of Sharing, a special offering that supports three transformative ministries of the Presbyterian Church USA. In the world of disaster, hunger, and oppression, Millions of people lack access to sustainable food sources, clean water, sanitation, education, and opportunity. The three programs supported by our One Great Hour of Sharing, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People do amazing work serving individuals and communities in need. From initial disaster response to ongoing community development, their work fits together to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. Families with children at home are invited to learn more about these efforts through a calendar of daily information tidbits and to use our fish-shaped coin banks provided to start a family collection. Our offerings will be dedicated in worship on Palm Sunday, March 28th. Also in preparation for Palm Sunday, I invite you to consider being part of a palm waving and Hosanna chanting flash mob right here on Harvard Avenue on Sunday, March 21st at 2 p.m. Our palm waving and joyful noises will be recorded for inclusion in the Palm Sunday worship video. And in worship today, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper virtually. Swarthmore Presbyterian Church celebrates an open table, which means that all who desire to know the love of Jesus Christ are welcome to partake. In preparation for communion, I invite you to prepare the Lord's table with bread and juice in your home. Any bread or juice will do For it is Christ's grace that makes the ordinary extraordinary. For details on all our current opportunities, please see our website, read our weekly notes, or contact the church office. Again, welcome all of you to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust.
Despite all that God has taught us, we still act foolishly. We are still weak. In the cross of Christ, we find forgiveness and grace. We confess our sins, trusting in God's wisdom and strength rather, rather than our own. Merciful God, forgive us for worshiping anyone or anything except you. Keep us faithful to you. Forgive us for thinking everything depends on our efforts and power. For you are the God who made us, led us out of slavery, and has brought us into the community of faith. Help us to depend on you alone and to rest in your peace. made confident in God's wisdom and strength rather than our own. For God loves us and claims us as God's own. With joy, let us draw water from the springs of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. God of glory, we cannot hear the heavens proclaim your handiwork. Though the speech of the skies must be magnificent, we cannot hear what day and night are singing about you, though their song must be both bright and deep. Yet somehow you are made known to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, who helps us to hear your word. Open our ears to what you are saying to us 
and perhaps we may also hear echoes of your glory in the broad firmament above. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from the first Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 to 25. Let us hear God's word for us today. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discriminant of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of, all, of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desired wisdom, desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? God, we look and listen for a word from you to give us a point of view that is more than our own. Help us to chew on it, savor it, and be made well by it. Amen. In life, we undergo more than we undertake. You have perhaps heard me say this before, and you'll likely hear me say it again, because it's hard to preach the gospel without acknowledging this existential reality. The reality is we are patients more than we are agents. Things happen to us that we did not cause, intend, or ask for. It seems to me that most of us, most of the time, would rather focus on those things that we can do something about, affect, and better yet, control. We would rather pour our energy into making and executing plans to bring about a future that we envision for ourselves and the world. I suspect that while we are in hot pursuit of our goals, we simply forget that we undergo more than we undertake. Often, it's not until circumstances arise that impede us from fulfilling our plans that we awaken to the fuller extent of our existential reality. When we suffer circumstances we never chose, like a global pandemic. When we suffer injury at the hands of others. When we suffer loss, the loss of a hard-earned job, the loss of a future envisioned, the loss of one's health that had been taken for granted, and certainly the loss of life. These are times when we become dramatically aware that we are patients more than agents. Living with this awareness is not easy. We struggle. As a parent, I struggle. I worry that I have sent falsely lopsided signals to my teenage daughter, equipping her with a strong sense of agency as though that is the only tool or a primary tool that she will need to navigate life. As a pastor, I know better. I know that we undergo more than we undertake. And I know that these are the experiences, sometimes traumatic, that call forth and put to use every ounce of faith in God we can muster. During the season of Lent, we know where Jesus is headed and we accompany him there. We know we will witness his suffering 
crucifixion, and death. And so we prepare ourselves for it. The scripture lesson we heard from Paul's letter helps to prepare us. Paul writes to the church he planted in Corinth. He knows that Corinth is a cosmopolitan city where people actively promote every advantage they may have in pursuit of their ends. He knows the Corinthians are exposed to different and new movements born from great oratory and appealing to their sense of worldly wisdom for worldly advantage. Paul himself has solid training in rhetoric, and he puts it to use. Paul's message, however, is about the cross of Christ. It is about what God underwent, what Christ suffered, and what we are called to bear. The message about the cross, Paul writes, is foolishness to the world. Listen to what he says. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Paul's rhetoric brings out how foolish our faith may look to the world. For to the world that values winners and rewards success, following a man who was crucified unto death would appear foolish. It would appear that we were faithful to a God who was weak and whose, whose mission and movement ultimately failed. But Paul knew better. He knew the message of the cross is essential to the gospel. The crucifixion of Christ was neither incidental nor accidental. That Christ bore the cross with such faithfulness to God is essential to the good news that God can be trusted at all times, even when we feel absolutely powerless and without agency. In an essay in the Christian Century magazine, philosopher and theologian James K.A. Smith writes about a time in his life when he struggled for this kind of faith in God. At the age of 18, when he converted to Christianity, he felt as though Christianity had been kept from him almost as a secret truth. So he took it upon himself in those days to let others in on this truth by buttonholing them with his preaching and teaching. Once he got to graduate school, he was so animated to pursue truth that he decided to become a philosopher. Unfortunately, he writes, nothing beats the love of wisdom out of you like a graduate program in philosophy. Though Plato tells us that philosophy begins in wonder, he found the graduate study of philosophy to be the place where wonder goes to die. Instead, it honed his polemical and analytical skills to be wielded like a sword. Now, however, as a middle-aged man, he wants to be more like Mr. Rogers than a heresy hunter. When you're young, he writes, it's easy to confuse strength with dominance. And when you're older, you realize the feat of character it takes to be meek. I used to imagine my calling was to defend the truth. Now I'm just trying to figure out how to love." End of quote. While he still cares about truth, he has had a change of heart and mind. No longer is he so confident that people can think their way out of the difficulties of the world and of their lives. 
It was not, however, simply the limits of thinking that led him to change his mind. It was, rather, a more personal, existential circumstance that served as a catalyst. He underwent a dark season of depression about which he writes, None of my analytical skills helped me claw my way out of the lonely trench in which I found myself, alienated from those right next to me. I won't adequately capture the despair of realizing that my intellectual strengths were powerless to dispel the black sun that oppressed me. It was a profound experience of puzzlement and bewilderment what is happening to me, I wondered. Why am I sobbing in the middle of the afternoon? Why am I either a monster of anger or a lethargic shell? Why do my wife and children feel a million miles away? And why do I keep pushing them even farther? In the face of depression, the power of reason in which he had invested all his trust failed. He couldn't think his way out of the darkness. Instead, he writes, a hand reached down into the pit. It was the hand of a Christian counselor. And he didn't just reach down into the pit. He jumped down there beside me, he writes. In telling his story, James Smith recounts an episode from the television show, The West Wing, in which White House Chief of Staff Leo McGarry reaches out to his deputy, Josh Lyman, who is struggling with PTSD. Leo tells him a parable. This guy is walking down the street when he falls down a hole. The walls are so steep he can't get out. A doctor passes by, and the guy shouts up, Hey, you! Can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription and throws it down in the hole and moves on. Then a priest comes along, and the guy shouts, Father, I'm down in this hole. Can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer throws it down in the hole, and moves on. Then a friend walks by. Hey, Joe, it's me. Can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. Our guy says, are you stupid? Now we're both down here. And the friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before and I know the way out. Though it wasn't overnight, James Smith and his counselor did find their way out. It took patience more than agency, because there wasn't anything James could do to save himself. There are times when none of the things we have been taught to do to effect change, to take charge of our world, and our own situation work. Sometimes such efforts even make things worse. It may feel like we are in a dark pit or in a dark tunnel, the end of which we don't know when we will reach. What we must allow ourselves to rest in is the promise that even there, God is with us as the psalmist sang in trust to God. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your right hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me fast. As the Apostle Paul preached in his letter to the church in Rome, 
Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, even when we undergo more than we can possibly undertake, when we must endure circumstances beyond our control, suffer loss, injury, and even death, God can be trusted to be with us and in Christ to have gone this way before. Amen. Having heard the word proclaimed, let us respond with faithfulness and with assurance in God's presence with us always. So we turn now to the Apostles' Creed, and I ask you, friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
It is in abounding and steadfast love that God has given us the gifts that we have. We are called as Christ's followers then to give freely of ourselves, our time, our talents, and our resources. Let us then return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. I invite you now as you are able to make an offering. Your offering may be made by using the mobile phone app, Give Plus Church, or by going to the Give to SPC button on the church's website. You may also simply mail in your check. Please write this to Swarthmore Presbyterian Church and indicate Sunday offering in the memo line. Thank you. As we come to this table, friends, we know that it is Christ who gathers us in, the lost and the lonely, the broken, the tired, and the wandering, all who long for the food that Christ offers. Christ gathers us in to be his company, to be with people not of our own choosing, but of Christ's choosing. I am so glad that we have come to meet and to eat and to be given a seat to be joined in the vine in this Christ table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, for you made us, O God, and before us you made the world we inhabit, and before the world you made the eternal home in which, through Christ, we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is mundane, have their origin in you. You are the source and fulfillment of all that is lovely and all who are loving. Grateful as we are for the world we know and the universe beyond our ken, we particularly praise you for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus, for his life which informs our living, for his compassion which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life again, we praise and worship you. Our gratitude rises too. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the songs of the church on earth and in heaven. And now, because words are not enough, we fall silent and remember him who came, setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside, emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands so that we might receive from Christ the healing, the holding, the accepting, and the forgiving which Christ alone can offer. Merciful God, send now your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and juice, to fill them with the fullness of Christ. And let that same Spirit rest on us, conforming us to the shape of him whose food we now share. Wanting to follow in his way, we pray then as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his disciples. And there he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. Offering it to them, he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Each time we eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. and offering it to them said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, each time that we eat bread and we drink, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, though your wisdom appears foolish to the world, your power is made perfect in weakness. We thank you that in Christ you have taught us the way of love. May your love be the measure of our lives. Amen.
May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace today and forevermore. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you.